Turn that up, Tim. How much lag are we on? Yeah. Good evening, people, and welcome to another edition of uh, Life is People. Um, my name is Life Tim. is People. <laughs> How are you doing, Ryan? Doing good, Tim. Glad to have Robert on. Loved it. Uh, I was about to start rapping over that beat. <laughs> well, that's what my uncle used to call me when I was little. Rabbit. <laughs> Well, tonight we're um, we're joined by we're joined by um, Robert Leach. Um, I'm sure I'm really uh, honoured to be having on the show tonight. We started off tonight with the tune um, Colour TV 4720, um, one of my favourite tunes by Robert. So I'm, I'm going to go s straight into tonight, and I'm, I want to ask Robert really, basically. Where did it all start for you, Robert? Where, tell me, the, where did it all begin? What, what age? Well, it started uh, young, because when I was in elementary school, I played the violin. Uh, my grandmother, somehow, I, I don't know if it was my grandmother, but somehow my mother got a violin. And so I started taking lessons, and I was going to this uh, music school, called Metropolitan Music School. It's two blocks up on Central Park West. I think it's 74th Street, right up the street from the Dakota. I used to have to walk past the Dakota every time I went to uh, go for my music lessons. And my music teacher, I still remember her name, was Mrs. Rosova. And I, I was getting pretty good on the, uh, on the violin. And then she encouraged me to take uh, lessons from uh, uh, a violinist at the Metropolitan Opera. He was uh, the only black violinist at the time, and I think he still is. And I was taking uh, lessons how old, from How old were you at the time? Uh, I must have, this was when I was in uh, fourth grade. So, uh, this is oh, four, wow. Yeah, fourth grade. So I must have been uh, younger than 10, 8, 9, 10 years old, something like that. And then I switched. I used to see the drummer having so much fun uh, when he uh, left. When I was in fifth grade, I switched to the drums. 
and then in uh, junior high school, for some reason, I wasn't uh, playing music. And it didn't happen until I got to high school. Uh, I was able to get a saxophone uh, from a, a elementary school teacher that I had. Well, she actually wasn't my teacher, but I knew her from elementary school, and she lived on my block. And it used to be her brother's saxophone. And the thing is, her name is Mrs. Lambie. She's actually the niece of Polonius Monk. So I was, I got uh, oh, wow. her <laughs> saxophone, and I started practicing, practicing, practicing. And my uncle was giving me lessons because he, he used to be a jazz saxophonist. And uh, he did it occasionally professionally. And then he encouraged me. He said I was moving so fast with my lessons, he encouraged me to get a real teacher. So luckily, on my block, Jimmy Heath lived on my block. And he still lives on that block. So I studied with him. And I studied with him for a few years. And then when I uh, was in college, I was able to get him to get some students in uh, he was able to get paid from some of the students I referred to him. And then he went on to uh, teach at night, now if I'm not mistaken. Put the jazz mobile, jazz into action, funk, soul, R&B groups. And then I saw how the scene was changing. And uh, all this time I'm playing in different groups and uh, I actually was touring with a few groups. We made some records. I was with this group called Hidden Strain. We were on United Artists. Uh, that was my first major label uh, signing and first major label group. Uh, it's a whole story. About how, about how old were you when you got uh, signed the first time? Oh, uh, let's see. I must have been about 20 years old, around 20 years old, because I remember having a birthday, and I was saying 21, and I was already in the group for like two years, and we were, uh, you know, touring and uh, recording. Uh, we got a chance to meet a lot of top acts. We opened up for Ike and Tina Turner, Elephant's Memory, which I don't know if you know, that was John Lennon's backup group. Uh, we opened up for Mahogany Rush. Uh, who else? Uh, Larry Graham and Graham Central Station. Uh, we played at the Fillmore East. Uh, we opened up for Earth, Wind, and Fire. And uh, we did quite a few uh, very nice gigs. Uh, Max's Kansas City, you probably heard of that. That used to be a famous club in New York. It's closed now. Uh, we did things that uh, when we did. The Larry Graham concert, we were at the, uh, what is that? We were in Atlanta. That's, what's the name of that? Uh, it's a famous, uh, it's a famous, it was right across the Fox Theater. That's it. Um, Fox Theater. We opened up at the Fox Theater in Atlanta. And then we had a gig with Mahogany Rush for a whole week. They're a Canadian group, Frank Mar Marinaro. He's a, a great guitar player. He used to play in the vein of Jimi Hendrix. And uh, we did a whole week with them. And then we also did another week, and we opened up for Willie Dixon, a famous blues artist and producer from Chess Records. So I'm a, I'm a big fan of Willie Dixon. A lot of cool. top people, you know? So what happened is when I switched over to the keyboard, I had realized the scene was changing. Uh, you know, the calls for session work and uh, for saxophonists started to uh, get, you know, less and less. And I realized you had to have the equipment, you know, to be able to record and uh, do your thing and to have product to take around to try to get, you know, get a deal. So that evolved into what, I, what I'm doing now. So it's, it was a lot of uh, hits and misses, you know, with that, you know, uh, 
I was started out doing, uh, you know, production for different vocalists and rappers and trying to get them deals, and then I realized, you know, I got to concentrate on just getting my stuff out and stop worrying about getting something for somebody else like a vocalist or a rapper because, you know, when you're dealing with people, it's very hard to get them to uh, understand the whole process of, uh, of the business and uh, they're not always on time. You they don't always show up when you when you book a session. And that was before I had the equipment. So, you know, you're waiting for them to show up. And meanwhile, you know, money's going down the drain because you 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 can't get anything done if they're not there. You know, to put their uh, part on. So, you know, that's that's about it. So eventually, I got to where I am now. There's a whole lot yeah. of other stuff uh, I'm leaving out, but I'm trying to condense it. Yeah. yeah. Um, when you when you said that the um, the call for actual like horn players and stuff uh, started dropping off, do you think that was like kind of due to uh, synthesizers and the way that uh, you could play? You know, you could have horn samples on a keyboard, and you know, you could play a whole horn section. You know, just one, one keyboard player could play like a whole horn section. Uh, so it just seemed, I mean, logically it just seems to me that when that started to come, when synthesizers started to come around, it seemed like a lot of uh, actual instrument players kind of seemed to get the, uh, kind of put on the back burner. Does that that's seem like actually, that? Was, that's true, but what happened uh, before, before they had the synthesizers that's out now, they had like the Move synthesizer, they had the, uh, there's another, the Fairlight, a couple of things, bef that's before sampling, but people realized, like you said, they can get the sounds and different sounds that they wanted and they didn't really uh, need a, a, a horn player or a horn section because it's an added expense that, frankly, you know, they could do without. And you, once you see, like, a trend that your uh, position is becoming more or less obsolete or becoming uh, diminished, you have to make a change. So I, I, I did quite a few things. I, I started interning as an a, a engineer, a engineer assistant. So I did that at a few studios. Uh, the, the main studio that I did it at was called Calliope Studio in uh, New York. That's on West 37th Street. And I got a chance to meet like one of the top engineers in, in, the, in the business, uh, Bob Power. So he took me under his wing and I got a chance to see how he worked. I got a chance to meet Prince Paul, and he actually recommended me to assist him on a, a session. That's before uh, Queen Latifah came out, because he said, I got this new uh, female rap uh, vocalist. She's going to be hot. I said, oh, what is her name? He said, uh, Latifah. <laughs> so I said, wow, so he was playing the different stuff that he was doing. And one thing that stuck in my mind, you might find this interesting. He played something, and he had like about three or four different samples going against each other, and it was creating a nice, what I thought was a nice blend. It was almost like tribal, the the, uh, the beat that resulted from uh, all these synthesized, all these samples working against each other, and they were complementing. And he was just saying, oh. I don't really like that, and I said, "Wow, that sounds good." I, you know, so I uh, had that in my mind that I'm going to do that. I'm going to uh, use that concept, and uh, you know, like with James Brown, the Funkadelics, you know, R&B funk groups, they have different uh, beats and different uh, call and answer. So everything is like vibing off each, each other. So you may hear one uh, one lick and then you hear like an answer to it. And that sort of co causes the groove to happen. And it, it's very interesting, the whole process of music. 
Are you talking like a uh, sort of like a call and response as far as the way he sampled, as far as like playing one sample for maybe like half a bar and then playing another sample? Is that what you're saying? Well, actually, they were all playing together, but the way the sample was, they 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 complemented each other. So they didn't okay. all fill up the same uh, melodic line space. You know, they weren't competing with each other for the space okay. that he uh, I, I allotted. Got so they weren't necessarily, like, uh, playing over top of each other, but at the same time, they they were, <laughs> if that makes sense they, to any producers adding, out there. But they were playing over the top of each other, but they were, they were adding different elements to the beat. So to give you, like, a, a like, say, for instance, to, to bring it to, like, a... To like a drum set. Say one sample was acting like the drum and the, uh, the bass drum and the snare, while the mm -hmm. other sample acting more like a melodic line that had like little hits and stabs in it that didn't always, you know, within the interval of the sample, didn't it wasn't continuous. So it, it, you yeah. had like a space and then it came in and then. So it's, it, they're like complementing each other. Yeah, that's it's like that's a, really it's cool. Like I'm a an huge orchestration sample. Okay, I mean, I totally understand what you're saying. I'm a huge fan of Prince Paul. I love hearing even hearing him talk about uh, you know the history of hip hop and stuff like that. He's such an amazing person to hear talk, just because he's so uh, so experimental and at the same time so in tune with the history of it. And uh, yeah, I actually heard a podcast where he had Lovebug Starsky on and they were talking about the origins of hip-hop, and he was only playing, I think, hip-hop records from pre-1980, pre I think. And he was playing all these, you know, just 1980, 1979, like, real old-school hip-hop tracks. And, yeah, hearing him and the way he samples, you know, uh, I can definitely hear that in you, and a lot of... I can hear all that, uh, that history and that funk sampling and the... Uh, even the originality, it's just... Uh, yeah, that's one of the things I love about uh, production nowadays is hearing people who go outside of sampling, but at the same time, I can hear that they've sampled. I can hear that you got you've gone through and you you know you've played around with stuff, but at the same time, you went beyond that. And that's what I love about music nowadays is being able to see people that uh, t actually go in, do the work, study the history, and actually you know have years and years and years of like looking into it, studying and trying to figure out, you know, what's happening and yeah, fi hearing your music was just as great as uh I think when I first heard Zap. <laughs> uh, and you, you know, know was, uh, Okay. You you mentioned Zap and I just remembered I used to play with Evelyn Champagne King and we opened up for uh Zap and I met all those guys. Roger Troutman, his brother, the whole Zap band, you know. Wow. And we did quite a few gigs with them. I, I didn't mean to cut you off, but it, you just triggered a, a, a memory. <laughs> well, I, I like the way that, um, I told you before, I was a huge um, Smooth the Hustler. So how did you get contact with him? Uh... I'm trying to remember how it happened. I think I met one of his management people at one time, and I had his card, so I called, and they told me to come down to the uh, studio, uh, which is in Brooklyn, where I live now. It's not too far from where I live now, but at the time I was living in Queens. Uh, I had mentioned it to you in the, uh, in my email to you, Corona Queens, and uh, so I used to go from Queens to Brooklyn. And him, uh, Smooth the Hustler. So me and him got along pretty good. I, I just, uh, I think I did some uh, keyboard work on uh, two tracks. And uh, I, at the time, I was still playing saxophone, but I was trying to get away from that. And I was slowly putting it, you know, to the side and, 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 uh, promoting myself more as somebody that will, you know, do the keyboard work on the session rather than uh, play saxophone. 
Yeah, I was making the transition, so to speak. And and now mostly you, we've been just sort of discussing through email. You do mostly a, you know a lot of your work um, through keyboard, yeah. I mean, is that the something you find is an instrument that you can be most expressive through, or is that just one you feel more comfortable? With? Well, with the with the way I'm set up now. How much more? I when you're when you're a saxophonist and you're with the technology that we have available now, I can create a whole orchestra. I can create a whole band. I can do so much. All the parts. As a matter of fact, Ryan, I don't even sample. I have a sampler, but I don't even use it. I found that I create the same feel by playing a lick that I come come up with in my head and make it sound like I used the sample. And I can create that whole atmosphere and that just comes from playing in so many bands and, and hearing so much great funk and R and B and jazz and all types of great music, you know, and being around a lot of uh, very good uh, players. So I have an interesting concept because a lot of people rely religiously on samples, and I don't even use them. You, I mean, I did. You have, you know, yeah, that, that's what I was gonna say. I mean, I can when when Tim played when Tim played the song in the intro, uh, that song specifically, like I can tell there's no samples in that. I can tell that's all you, and that maybe that's just me because I've gone. Uh, not the same route as you, but kind of, kind of in the same way where uh, you know I went, I studied uh, sampling. Uh, I've done, I've done some really uh, great sample work as far as uh, my own opinion goes, and you know I was really proud of it. And I did that for years. And then at the same time, uh, when I started doing bad ideas, I didn't want. When I started doing the soundtrack for it, I was like, well, I probably can't do any samples. Uh, et cetera, et cetera. So I started going outside of uh, sampling and started doing my own. And you know, I think a lot of producers and a lot of music makers could actually benefit if they, uh, you know, kind of stepped away from the samples. And that's what that's one of the things I really love about your music specifically is I can hear, you know, that history that like I know you've gone through. Uh, and even without hearing you talk about it, like I for some reason I can just hear in the music that like I know that you've sampled before. I know that. I hope we lost Robert. Well, I'll keep talking like he's here. <laughs> but I can hear in Robert's music that he's sampled before and that, uh, you know, he's he's done that sort of history. And uh, it's one of the things that uh, I think, you know, anybody can go out there and make something and be original, but it's the word that we talked about on our solo podcast, Tim, of Offenbahn to transcend and to preserve you know he's we've gone in we've done the history we've actually you know used the techniques that were done back in that time period and then uh, you know we learned how to do it we kind of felt that we got to a point where you know it just seems like you, it kind of becomes a routine you know you find a sample you put it in you play a little keyboard over it you know, it kind of gets uh, I don't want to say old but it gets a little bit routine and so you know as a music maker that's something you necessarily and even as a an artist or a painter i'm sure you can agree with that tim that you don't want to really get sucked into a routine of how to do something you know because it it kind of hinders that whole creative process you know if i'm going to go in every single time and be like you know i'm going to start with this sample i'm going to start with this funk loop you're kind of pigeonholing yourself. You're kind of uh, your sound is going to kind of come out the same, and that's one of the things I love about Robert, and one of the things I love about uh, George uh, B. Demon and the Ceiling Demons is that you can go from song to song, and you can almost hear different history throughout it. You don't have to. You know, uh, so many producers that I hear on, I want to call them SoundCloud producers, because a lot of them have this kind of trap, rap type beat with the southern drum hat rolls that are really fast and, you know, really booming 808 kicks and stuff like that. And then if you go in and listen to an album of these guys, the whole album is southern drum hat rolls, 80, booming 808s. So, 
little John type like synthesizer loop and you know, it's great for what it is but to hear that every single song and to not be able to hear any history behind that music before like 1998 like really kind of baffling you know to see the to see the MPC has replaced like old funk breaks and to see, like, there's not a whole lot of people, you know, going in and experimenting with those old funk breaks. Like, uh, the, the technology in itself, there's so much to be had. There's so much to do. And uh, it seems like a lot of people just hop on a sort of sound and just kind of go with it. And once again, that was one of the things I loved about hearing Robert's music and my whole, uh, like, I loved Zap. When, I can't remember how old I was when I heard Zap, but uh, probably 14 or 15. And, like, Zap blew me away. I love the sound of Zap. And uh, Roger Troutman and the whole vocoder, and then getting into those uh, funk groups, hearing that, and then you started hearing that in the '90s uh, rap music. Then once it got to you know late 2000, all of a sudden that sort of stuff kind of stopped. Uh, probably after Will Smith sampled uh, "And the Beat Goes On" for Miami, but. <laughs> uh, <laughs> But I think there's a lot to be done you know, with it, and uh, a lot of originality can be put into it, and that's where I was going, anyway. <laughs> Dr. Dre actually used Roger Troutman and a lot of those funk uh, musicians on his, uh, on his productions. He would make a sample <clears throat> and then have the funk musicians play over it. Uh, music sounded so unique and to the straight up uh, cut and paste samplers from New York. I could I heard that on uh, I think it was California Love because I had heard the original song and I had heard a bunch of the other stuff and I'm still listening to the Tupac version and I'm like it sounds really really good it doesn't sound like he sampled that but at the same time it kind of was but yeah I, I can totally see that now that he had you know, the actual funk players come in and play that. Yeah, he used both. And then he's such a great mixer with his music that he's able to get a proper uh, ambiance. He creates a, a, a proper uh, the two-type two recording, which I find very interesting. You know, I guess it's the same when you have different scenes and how you edit and how you utilize the music and the, the sound of the movie and the, uh, the look of the movie, you know, the way you uh, have the various, how can I say it, uh, the way you can tweak it. You can tweak color, you can tweak the sound, you can use music sparsely or you can use it to emphasize something, you know, the, the whole creative process. You know how people are able to take basically the same tools and get so various unique uh, product out of it. That, that's what I, that's what I love about the great musicians: the way they're able to uh, make themselves unique and stand out. And once you hear their work, you know that that's them. Anytime a Dr. Dre uh, track comes on, you know that's Dr. Dre. Anytime a RZA track comes on, you know that's you know the, the RZA. You know a lot of uh, a lot of people have that sound that they've uh, developed, and it, and it's constantly evolving. So uh, this this music and this uh, multimedia uh, movies, television, it's such a fascinating uh, medium to work with. Well, I, exactly, Robert. I mean, I think the two words that you hit the man on the head then were development and evolution. And development comes from which learning and and like you've done with, with all the instruments you've done. And, and with man, you learned from the great Jimmy Heath, who is another man who learned and learned and learned and never stopped learning. And from that, you can develop. And that is where I think you know creativity stems from. It doesn't just pop out of nowhere. It's, it's something that's been developed over a long period of time. 
Well, I think once you Jimmy once you think you've learned everything, you're. Well, I was just gonna say real quick. I think once once you think you've learned everything, you are unable to learn anything, and that's that's kind of a sorry state. I yeah, think to be in for. Places. Uh, Dizzy Gillespie used to always say, the day you don't learn anything, anything that day, you've had a bad day. Yeah. I think you're racing. I think we've got some lag going on here. But I think you're right. I mean, you, what would you say was the one lesson other than what he taught you in how to actually play the instrument that, that you picked up from Jimmy Heath? Oh, we lost him. Okay. I'm sorry, I'm eating a jalapeno cheddar cheese bagel and some hummus right now. <laughs> That's the rock and roll way, my man. Yeah. <laughs> 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 well, I can up. tell you what I learned from. <laughs> Go on. I can tell you what I learned from. But, <laughs> so uh, I guess while we're waiting for Robert, what do the uh, the every step follow the lights remix? What is planned as far as Ceiling Demons and Fold? I heard they're doing a show for that. 28th of doing a show. Um, it's been well. We could talk about what this. We could talk about this week. What's happened with the um, sort of like the pre-release? I mean, I, I had a couple of days off 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 radar, and it all went to went absolutely mental, didn't it? I mean, do you want to tell more about that ride? I mean, it... <laughs> well, I was there for it. I was. I th I think I was the only one watching it. Some somebody sent me something on Twitter saying I had earned points for the ceiling demons by retweeting something and. Uh, I was like, what the hell is this? I don't even know what's going on. And so I click on shows that the Ceiling Demons, uh, the so the remix that they had released that I'm doing the video for, uh, they had released it on a blog. I can't remember the blog right now. But uh, somehow it ended up on the most popular tracks on Twitter. And it ended up at... I started following it. It was at like 42 and got all the way up to 26. Which is... And I think it, it was on there for a couple days. I'm sure it's probably still on there. And um, but yeah, I saw it max out at 26 most popular tracks on Twitter. That's a pretty man. That's an amazing thing to accomplish, right there. I'm I'm proud of them. I'm glad I yeah, was able to too. earn them some points on that one. I hear you. Oh, okay, I, I got kicked off and I had to rejoin. And I was. Uh -oh. Can you guys hear me? I think we're a bit of a lag. Oh, okay. Well, I'm fine. I can hear you now. Can you hear me? Yes, I hear you quite fine. Yes. Cool. Ryan, can you hear me? Uh, I hear everybody. Cool. Yeah, I was talking about Jimmy and what. Great musician he is. Yeah. And uh, not only does he play well, he's also a great writer and orchestrator. And uh, this is a, a unique experience that I've had with uh, Jimmy Heath. He 
he used to take his family on vacation in the summer, and he wanted somebody to watch the house since we lived on the same block. And he said, man, uh, you stay at my house. You can practice over here. You know, whatever's in the refrigerator, you eat, eat whatever's in the refrigerator. <clears throat> you know, you can read my books, listen to my records. And I got a chance to uh, read his books. He had Walter, uh, the Piston book orchestration. He had a great collection of records that I, I think I listened to everything he had. I'd stay up all night listening. And he had his scores laid out on the table when he was doing his orchestration. And so I used his music, you know, the stuff that he had experience. And then I would actually hear Did we lose him again? Nah, we lost him again. Yeah, I think <laughs> the joys of Google uh, lost my friend. <laughs> so you had a few days off up in the... What'd you do, Highlander? <laughs> <laughs> well, to be honest, my friend, I mean, I'm kind of um, writing a blog for... Carmsing, which you know, which is the uh, which is the magazine, obviously for Calm, and it's been for Rachel yeah. that we had on. Um, yeah, that's right, and uh, it's all around the story of every step, and it, it's amazing how when you actually try to formulate your thoughts on how that tune has developed and how the whole process has gone, it's it's very inspiring because it's it's like what you were saying. We we've, we've taken an idea and we've all collaborated together and we've we've changed something from a bit like we you know from what George was saying from what we've all been saying from something that was original Arthur Russell song to what it is now from a set from a from an angle where we none of us knew each other. We were all separated from you know time differences and continents and countries. And it's just a an overview of that, but it's um I'm enjoying the last few days of winter, to be honest, right? The last few days of autumn before that winter kicks in. Yeah, it's getting cold. I just saw something that uh, was on AOL.com. It said, like, uh, winter arrives early in the U.S. or something like that. All right, whatever. We'll deal with it. <laughs> we'll drop a bomb on something stay warm, you know. <laughs> I think it was back then. No, real quick though, one great quote that I remember hearing uh, from a poet, I, it might have been Saul Williams, but he said something like, uh, war is God's way of teaching Americans geography. <laughs> <laughs> okay, Robert, when you got kicked off, you were right at the point of uh, you said he had uh, left his compositions out. Yes, some of the stuff that he was working on, and uh, I had a chance to you know glance study it, and uh, then I heard some of the arrangements that he did that was already finished products, and uh, the just the way the texture, just the colors that he gets from the the way he orchestrates, he's an incredible musician. He has fantastic ears. I mean, this man can hear anything. I mean, you could just take your hand and just plink it down on the uh, keyboard anyway, and he'll tell you the... Uh, Oh no. Then you have the fifth, then you have the raised knife, the flatted knife. He'll tell you everything in the chord. And and you couldn't fool him. He just heard it that clearly. He was that great. Uh, his ears were that fantastic. 
it, it used to amaze me. I can't even do what he does. You know, uh, I, I have my own thing, but these guys, they came from the old school. They, could, they were just incredible musicians. They really, really studied and continue to study. Yeah, I mean, that was definitely true for the, all the old, uh, like you said, the old legends. I mean, I'm a big blues fan, and I think, man, some of, I mean, some of the stuff that they were doing 100 years ago, I mean, it really hasn't really changed that much to this day. And it's amazing to me because I think they were just gifted people. But it, as I said before, it's not about just being gifted. It's about putting the work in. And, I mean, I... I from what my little knowledge of Jimmy Heath is and people like that, and, you know, they worked and worked and worked and worked, and because they had to, because it was a different world, I suppose. Yeah, they, 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 they always studied, and they used to share. Their, and they would, they would have a chance to apply their knowledge at uh, jam sessions and on the gig. So they had to advance uh, the knowledge as far as their playing is concerned. And so it was studying. Yeah, it was involved in. And whereas that does not happen to who's a, uh, a jazz musician, because the scene in New York, uh, like they used to. Have seen and uh, uh, there were so many clubs you could play at and develop and uh, you know get your craft together. That just doesn't exist anymore. Uh, it's a whole nother it's a whole nother ball game now. It's uh, it's just that you have to adapt to you know the way it is because uh, like you say life is people, but life is always changing. You know it. it the world is never static; it's constantly evolving. So we, I guess, the successful people have to adapt and be, see trends and to, you know, be ahead of the curve. And what's going on that's current and make it new and make it their own. System. You know the creative process. All forms, whether you're a poet or someone that you know draws, or artist, director, you know the 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 process is constantly changing. Even in the way you like this, it, it's constantly changing. Yeah, and that's one of the the things that I've and talked about with bad ideas. Is it's, at, it's at an accelerated rate now. And yeah, that's one of the things with bad ideas is you know I was a rapper, uh, and that was when I was you know sixteen, seventeen, up until I think I was twenty, and um, I don't know if you ever, Robert, if you've heard of Eastern Conference Records or the High and Mighty. But they're a rap group out of New York, and I ended up doing an album with them when I was like 20. And uh, the stuff that I was working on, as far as music went, oh. it, it wasn't saying as it wasn't saying as much as I wanted to. And uh, so, eventually, uh, my music connections kind of fell apart. And you know, like you said, uh, you know, things evolve and things change. And that was one of the things that uh, happened to me creatively, where I had. I loved movies, you know, ever since I was a kid, but I never had any idea or notion of ever doing one or having anything to do with one. I was always music. I was real big into hip hop, and um, yeah, it just, I, it, I wasn't saying what I wanted to, and uh, oh, right. suddenly that that made a shift into film. And uh, I've had very few times where I could actually speak openly about bad ideas, but. Uh, one of the things that I still felt that I carried on when I made bad ideas was hip hop. Uh, a lot of the a lot of the dialogue was taken from lyrics that I had written, and there was a certain flow to it. There was a hip hop dynamic that I kept going 
with the movie because I am a very even when I listen to music like old rock music or old uh, funk music, old jazz music, whatever. Uh, the ones that I really like the most are the ones that sort of you can hear that sample in it. You know, it's got that kind of hip hop flow to it. Like that's always kind of been me. You know, that steady sort of East Coast sort of 80 beats per minute. Like that's I don't know. That seems to be my inner tempo. We lost Robert again, but I'll keep going. Um, but yeah, that was one of the things, uh, you know, music does evolve and uh, people evolve and, you know, we go into different mediums and uh, that's one of the things I love about people is not just saying like, you know, I love the music of this artist. I actually love the artist, you know, I'm, look I'm not looking for Ceiling Demons next album to sound like their first album. I don't want it to sound like that. I want to hear them evolve, you know. I want to hear them go, you know, one step further as well as one step back, transcending, preserving. You know, I want to see them keep going, keep building. I don't, you know, and the, a lot of the music, I think people feel the need to kind of go back to, you know, we have to capture that energy we had on that first single. And uh, you, whatever, that's just, that's all about, you know, the money, the ratings, etc. But out there putting forth the effort, putting forth the experimentation, trying to go one step further while, you know, just building yourself up every step. You're building up. You need to be building up or otherwise you're just going to be standing still. I think that's the, the only element that we, we work from. I mean, I... I've said this before in the podcast that I think one of the things that I know that artists and musicians and I think just people who are creative generally suffer from is the burden of being having to be original when all we are doing, I mean I, I as an artist can only look at certain people that I've influenced my career and people that have influenced how I do things as a good thing, I don't see it as a bad thing and it's, I'm always trying to progress, I'm always, like we were saying before, where when I that we talk about the, the follow the lights. I, mean, I try to take something that I'm seeing and push it to my to the to the limit of what I can do. I I think it's something that um, if you're creative, it just comes naturally to you almost because you you're always wanting to like you said we're always the edgy ones. We're always the ones that want to push and any kind of construction of what maybe is a boundary because we ultimately know that the deep unconsciousness that we tap into has no it has no limits, it has no boundaries. That's that's where, like we said, we went from music has developed. You know, I mean we were talking about it before, I mean Robert you were saying about, you know, how the blues developed into the jazz. I mean the jazz boys took the elements of what they were hearing and pushed it and pushed it and pushed it. They didn't See an, an edge to it. They just, and then you have from that some of the greatest musicians, Louis Armstrong, the, the Jimmy Smith, the Jimmy Hughes of the world. I mean, would you agree? Yeah, I I got uh, got the just of what you were saying and uh, the music is always being pushed and uh, the, the boundaries are always being moved forward and uh, I guess it's like life you know uh, we're a constantly evolving species we're learning I should say we're relearning who we are and what we can be and our capabilities so it's a very interesting process that uh, we as people are going through, you know, whether it's music, technology, or uh, ad advancement in uh, the way the nations get along with each other or don't get along, or it, it's a constantly evolving uh, process. And it's very fascinating to, uh, you know, to witness and also read about. But like, if you go back in history, you see that. Things are almost the same, but they're not the same. It's just that the technology that was available then is different. But uh, people are basically you know, do the same 
similar things. You know, the belief systems have changed, but we're constantly moving forward. We're spiraling. We're, uh, I like to think, you know, uh, I like to think we're uh, moving towards the golden age. We've gotten out of the dark age, but we're we're moving forward and uh, we're more receptive to the knowledge that's available. So it's, it's a very interesting process that this planet is going through. Robert, I don't know if you've seen uh, any of the. Uh, it's called '80s synth revival, and it's I've been getting, I'm totally sucked into it. But it's uh, all these producers uh, from around the world. Uh, I don't know. It's kind of like this subconscious collective where people have been going back and basically, basically with the mindset of you know they can do '80s music better than the '80s could. So they're using, they're trying to get all these, uh, all those eight sounds from the 80s of, uh, you know, the electronic music, kind of like uh, Miami Vice and sort of that more dance pop uh, sort of sound. And they're going back and uh, basically, in my opinion, doing it better. They're actually, because it, they, they have this feeling and this notion that somehow the technology advanced before anybody actually was able to sort of perfect what was happening at the time. And that was one of the things I found interesting about the 80s, or this 80s synth revival that's going on. There's several artists like uh, Betamax, uh, Laserhawk, Perturbator, Vincenzo Salvia. Um, I can list out Calm Trues. I can keep going because I know tons of them because I'm so into it. But it's, uh, yeah, like you said, it's a, it's a very weird thing, like watching people evolve and then sometimes seeing people go back to their roots and uh, what they're making now and uh, what they're doing with it. And I think a lot of, like, especially with Fold, like Fold, I, I don't want to say it sounds like a revival to me, but, uh, you know, that whole concept of, you know, a live hip-hop or even live band beyond, uh, you know, mainstream rock and roll, you know, uh, I mean, you have your fish, you, your jam bands, your acoustic hookah, string cheese incident, whatever, and then you have alternative rock, Creed, Godsmack, God knows who, whatever is popular right now. But as far as like a, you know, band band, uh, seeing somebody like Fold come out, you know, not a lot of people are doing that. And even as far as jamming, you know, people, it doesn't see, one of the things Robert said in the first, uh, you know, probably, I think, two minutes uh, of his talking was uh, he saw a drummer who was, ha he was playing one instrument, I think he said the violin, and then he saw a drummer and he said, wow, look at how much fun that drummer's having. And that's one of the things about music is, uh, you know, it is about the fun. And... Um, Robert, I was just talking about how you said uh, you were playing violin and you watched the drummer and you saw how much fun the drummer was playing. And to me, that's one of the things that I feel is kind of lost in music nowadays is that sort of element of fun and jamming. And I've actually talked to people, uh, Scott, the, uh, the bathroom attendant, the blues bathroom attendant in Bad Ideas, uh, I've jammed with him and multiple other people you know, a couple of times, and, like, we had a blast just jamming out, just getting on a different instrument every two seconds, and, you know, playing something and doing something, and somehow it was actually, like, a song, and uh, one of the problems he's always had, and he's told me about, is, you know, that idea of people being able to jam, and being able to, you know, somebody just sitting down at a drum set, and, you know, just kind of whittling out a rhythm out of nowhere, and then somebody getting actually playing for fun and just doing it out of the heart and soul. Whereas what he was having problems with was, you know, somebody wanting to show up all the time with uh, lyrics and basically, you know, I want to say an, an alternative rock song of some sort and just kind of having a, you know, verse, chorus, verse, chorus, verse, chorus. And it's like, this is what we're going to play. You're going to play in this chord. We're going to do 16 bars. Then you're going to do eight bars. We're going to do a fill at this. And it's really nothing. Whereas, you know, the fun of it lies in just showing up and playing, you know. And that's, uh, 
I feel like that's a concept that's kind of lost in a lot of the music. I, you, you don't really hear the fun. But that's what I loved hearing about Robert saying when he was playing violin and he saw the drummer and he was like, you know, look at how much fun like he's having. Like that is what music needs, you know, is those people that are showing you, you know, just how much fun it can be and what you can get out of it by having fun and experimenting and just playing around and having a good time. And, you know, it doesn't have to be about uh, restricting yourself to bars and loops and you know, et cetera, et cetera. It's, it's a freeform art. It's freeform expression. You, you don't have to keep yourself to things. Do we lose Robert again? <laughs> That's all right. I think I got one more bagel. I got another bagel and hummus left in me. I can do this. <laughs> <laughs> but that's the same, right? With, you know, with any kind of. I mean, that, what you're just saying then is exactly the same with, with what I do. Do you know what I mean? It's. It, it's what I love. One of the no. things I love about what's going I, on. It, one of the. I mean, like I, I take, I take the, and demons and stuff. Well, I take things on a very broad things scope. Things arising that are almost like you were saying about like the Simpsons in the eighties. They're bringing back old ideas. I mean, one of the things I love about what I do with the Stephen Demons is it's bringing back real live art with a band that I used to see when. I mean, I was a fan of Derek Briggs and and I made it. I love the idea of what they had the the Eddie style, and then it all kind of died away, and then everything became electronic. And everything became very kind of computer generated album covers. And I love about the Soon Demons particularly is that they're open to that. And I think this is part of this what we've been talking about for weeks is the whole new as I keep saying in my you know, there's a creative the, the creative is rising. This we it's we, we go I don't know, there's a there's a great wave coming and I do see the bands like the fold and even down from ADT, you know, and seeing demons and stuff. These are the vanguards of this new stuff. You know, you're, you're doing what I'm doing, what what Robert's doing. Even these are this is this is a wave of tech stuff that's coming, man. And I think the reason that maybe it's not a wave, it's more of an untapped creative element that's been overlooked for maybe 20 years because of mainstream generally not one to look at us, you know, like Robert, Robert was saying that a lot of the clubs in New York are closed down. Oh man, it's the same over here, as we've, as we've talked about in previous, you know, podcasts. We, it's very difficult to get your creative experience out, you know, if you're a musician now you have to go through layers and layers and layers of, you know, bureaucracy. It's the same if you're a filmmaker, Ron was, was mentioning how much it cost him to do every single film. Same with me as an artist, I have to pay for a gallery space. And what what I'm saying is is that when you see what like Robert's doing or the Seen and Demons are doing or the Fold are doing or what you're doing, Ryan, or what I'm doing, it's all this is is it's always been there, but people have never recognised it, or the mainstream hasn't recognised it. But then the same is true with rap. Now, seeing Robert's back and I can hear it's ask Robert. I wanted, one of the things I wanted to really ask you Robert, was what's your experience of growing up in New York? I mean from someone like me who's only ever been there once. I mean, kind of share to me your experience of, of living in in New York. I've never been there, Tim. So Whoa. you're in Scotland and you've been there more than me. <laughs> yeah, I I'm 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 to, I'm a total New Yorker. I was born here, raised here, and I uh, got to know a lot of the different parts of the city. Scott, I was always one to uh, travel and move outside my neighborhood and and meet people from you know different neighborhoods. And uh, uh, Brooklyn, you know, that's where my father's family was from, and. and I had like Harlem, and just doing music, you meet people, get a chance to experience a uh, different neighborhood, different cliques, you know, of musicians. Or it, it's a very interesting process. And then you know, you know it's the whole uh, survival thing. New York is a very tough city. Uh, you know, I where you know Chicago.
people going through. You make a real life. I, uh, you know, it's an urban environment. You know, it's uh, it's not peaches and cream. It's like that. See a lot of different things. I think they have internet problems in New York. <laughs> <laughs> I think this is the night catching up. Yeah. Nope. <laughs> I can hear dogs. <laughs> Yeah, I was about to say that's your. Well, I, it's weird that we would hear the dog and not Robert. <laughs> <laughs> no, but this is so far. It's. I mean, I'm hearing everything pretty good so far. I mean, as far as you know, it's up for him getting cut off. But I think it's going great so far. I love hearing him talk history in New York and you know just how he got started and all that. It's mind it's, blowing. It's fascinating. You know what I mean? And I'm, he's fascinating. And, um, and what I find really fascinating is that this is what, what we're talking about. This is this, this. I didn't know about Robert two months ago. I didn't know about you three months ago. I love this. I love this. What's going on at the moment? It's as the demons say, the the seed is starting to flower and thrive, and we're seeing it around us. These are the greatest days to be living in. This is how we walk on the moon. I've actually been listening to a lot of Arthur Russell. I did not. He, I didn't even know about him, and I don't even think anybody I know is known about him until uh, you know. I saw uh, the Ceiling Demons, and I didn't even think about it. You know, the sample when I heard the song, I didn't think like, "Oh, I wonder where they got that sample from." You know, I just love the song. And then I think I saw, I forget, I, I think I might have seen Psy, I think Psy might have posted something about it, either on Twitter or Facebook, and I heard the original, and then I was just like blown away, and I was like, who the hell is Arthur Russell? And I was just reading about him the other day, and you know, experimental cello player, and I've been just watching him and listening to him all the time, and like, I've been trying to explain to people how it's not like... It seems like every song he plays, he's playing live for you, and that's just something that's very weird. It's not, or not necessarily weird, but you know, different. It's not a verse-chorus type thing. Verse-chorus, verse-chorus, verse-chorus. It's not a very pop, uh, orchestrated thing. But I don't know. I've been digging the Arthur Russell lately. But that's what I love about. Him. Robert's stuff um, tunes the music. I mean, I love, as I said before, I love to paint and draw over music. And I found Robert's music particularly, the same reason I like the fold, um, is it, it's very instrumental. And for someone like me when I'm drawing, I love to have just you know, no distractions. And it's something like me and Robert mentioned to me before. You were saying, Robert, that. Distraction can be one of the worst things for someone who's creative. And I loved your line was it was no no distractions when you're working. <laughs> Instructions do not distract me. Yeah, of course. Uh, people can actually take you out your groove and your vibe, and it, you know it's in the air. And when you're tuned in, it's just like uh, remember the old uh, Vernio radio dials. If someone Jars the uh, the the knob, you get off your station and you got to get it back, and it's hard to uh, tune in. But it's in the air, you know. Where where we have to tune ourselves to uh, the all the creative energy and everything that ever exists is in the air, and we just have to tune in to uh, to be able to receive it. And when you have a distraction, they sort of take you off that path.
Yeah, I love when people talk about a creative block or a writer's block or a musician's block or something like that. And it's not that it, it's not that you're blocked. It's that you're not being open enough. You're not receiving enough. You know, it's it, like you said, it, it is all out there. You know, it's not. Uh, it's sometimes you know a lot of people work towards ideas, but it's not that you have to work towards the idea. You just kind of have to let it. You know, you have to let the uh, minor details resonate and then the idea you know will flow it will come out you know it, it is all out there it's just uh, sometimes it's just a matter of waiting and you really don't have to wait that long but if you do try to force it you do try to stress it you know you will get that brain bubble and you will get that you know feeling of being blocked but at the same time you know you're probably just working too hard at it and you're thinking too much about it whereas if you just let it flow and let it come out Magic can happen. What happens is when you when you're trying too hard to be creative, you're actually constricting the ability of that information to, to transmit itself to you or to be able to receive it. Because it's all around you. It's it, it everything that ever exists or ever will exist is is there. Past, present future all exist at the same time. Any problem that you ever had, any solution that you ever need is there. We just have to lock into it to, uh, to be able to receive it. Uh, what you might find interesting, I don't know if you're familiar with the film uh, Ab What was that? It kind of cut out, out a little bit. On that, all in tune with these basically were functioning as a, 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 a universal conscious mind. And we have that ability as, uh, as humans. We have that ability to tune into uh, anything, anything that, any, any, any invention that you could possibly conceive is right there waiting for you to, to pick it up. And to work at it. Man, we need to get Robert a copy of Bad Ideas. <laughs> <laughs> That's all in your hands, my man, Ryan. That's all in your hands. Hey, I'll I'll totally send Robert a copy. That's what Bad Ideas. You know, that is the premise. That is the world of Bad Ideas. Is uh, you know, the past, present, the future. It is there. It is available. All you have to do is tune into it, and it's sort of uh, the movie basically starts out with uh, the stranger waking up in this world, and he doesn't know what's going on, and that's kind of, you know, if you if you live in that wor world, you know, at times you don't know what's going on, but it's just a matter of trying to funnel it into uh, the present that we actually live in now, and. It's it's fun. It's great. It's amazing. It's full of demons, and it is what it is. But that is, for me, that's been the creative process the entire time I've ever done uh, anything. Probably after bad ideas, because you know the philosophy behind that was just so deep that I'd never gotten into anything like that before. And uh, the ideas that I was presented or reading about in my research or doing whatever, like it was. It's just a matter of, you know what, it really is all there. It's about capturing the moment. It's about, uh, you don't have to force things. You know, we are human. It, it'll it come naturally. Everything will come naturally if you, uh, uh, you know, resonate. If it resonates long enough, the idea sits in, you know, we, we will get there. But at the same time, stubbornness will kill you if you're just locked into this mode of routine and uh, thinking what you're doing is right and you're going on this path and you have to keep that path and you have to keep doing this and this and this and this and you, if you're afraid of that change and if you're afraid of uh, beliefs uh, losing beliefs and losing things like that it's it can be a very frustrating thing but yeah the openness of you know music creativity all of that it, it, it comes from that uh, past present future um, you know it is it is available and I will get you the movie, Robert. <laughs> yeah, I, I did. I saw the trailer. I think uh, Tim Scott uh, sent me the trailer. 
uh, in the email uh, maybe about a month ago, I think. I, is that is that how it went, uh, Tim? I yeah. think you sent me that, and I, I told you I saw it, and that I really liked it. I think that's what happened. But uh, we are very unique as uh, I don't want to get too cosmic in because uh, of... Get cosmic. Get hey, cosmic, baby. That's what we do in Life is Evil. Rates of alternate realities of things that are considered not to be true or uh, not real. Everything is real. They're, they're, anything you can possibly conceive of happens and will happen or has happened or is happening. So it's uh, because of who we are and our limited view of our, of our capabilities, we we have to uh, we're conditioned. It's actually a, a, a it's actually a saving grace because of all the information that was available. If you were able to perceive it at one time, you would probably go crazy because you would you you wouldn't be able to turn it off. It'd just be so much information. And you wouldn't be able to lock into any one stream of, uh, how can I say, a stream of consciousness that, well, this, this is me. This is who I am. And I'm on this path because you would be hearing everything. And uh, that, that's quite interesting. I think people who have uh, mental illness, I think the fabric of their consciousness somehow got ripped. And what they really have is the ability to hear things that average people don't hear. They're hearing more than uh, one stream, you know, of consciousness. That and it, it's fr I guess it's quite frightening because if you're hearing so many things that other people don't hear, uh, you would be, you're considered a uh, lunatic, crazy, you know because you're not actually fitting in with uh, everybody else because they're not hearing that. So it's, 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 just, it's a fascinating, uh, you know, we can, uh, we can go off on a tangent that's so, uh, I don't want to put the word crazy, but so <laughs> far from the realm of what people think as the truth and possibility. We're we're only we're 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 dealing with a grain of sand of consciousness in the infinite beach of grains of sand. We're we're dealing with a finite capability of of infinite capability. So, uh, we, but we do have the ability to tune in. We do have that ability, but it it. Takes and uh, actually being able to uh, accept that it, these things exist. I don't know if that made any sense, but it. Uh, hey, it made total sense to me. <laughs> well, I mean, one of the things I've talked about on here is the uh, sort of societal webs, as far as uh, you know, things you're supposed to do. So if you're uh, you know, even, you know, say as a male getting a girlfriend, that would be point A to point B. Think of all the webs and strings that spawn off of that as far as how, you know, man gets woman. You know, you, you got dating, you got birthdays, you got presents, you have to think like the person, the music, the movies, the hanging out, the did they do this, did they do that, the past, the history, the future of, you know, getting to know somebody, everything. Like, there's so many strings and webs that get woven. And kind of what you were saying about mental illness, and uh, one of the things I've talked to Tim about, uh, one of the books that shaped my life, the the Politics of Experience by Artie Lang, uh, was he felt that these psychotic episodes were sort of breaks from that reality. And for me, it's almost like 
somebody falling through the webs of societal ties. And I've had that moment where, you know, the the strings bind us as far as going out and getting a pack of cigarettes and having to communicate with anybody as far as, you know, hi, hello, how you doing, how was your day, you know, if, what they're saying compared to actually what they mean, you know, that sort of thing. You know, there's a lot of strings that are involved and a lot of strings attached to all of us as far as our relationships. And, you know, a lot of that mental illness and um, psychotic episodes, schizophrenia, those things, you know, uh, a lot of it kind of is a, it's not a detachment from the web, but it's simply falling through the web. And if you can... There is still a, and this is all my opinion, obviously, but it, you know, there is still that attachment to reality. But it's such an attachment to reality that when they, when somebody in that moment speaks aloud, they're considered like, uh, you know, they're considered what you said. You know, I don't want to use the word crazy, but that is what somebody might get from them is that they're crazy. But at the same time, what they're saying does act, would actually make sense to them in the way that they are perceiving, living, and sort of falling through these societal ties which we have subconsciously interwoven between our lives. So I totally understand what you're saying. <laughs> yeah. Anybody well, understands what I'm saying? <laughs> I understand, what you, I understand uh, totally. We live in a... Uh, how can I say it? a matrix that has been created by the powers that be to keep control and to keep us at a certain level of understanding and wisdom. Exactly. Because if we went beyond that, it would make their, uh, their positions irrelevant because we would speak through it. But it's all about understanding and uh, expanding your mindset and your consciousness. And it's easier said than done. Uh, but there are things that happen on this planet that are just mind-boggling, but the average person is just not them, experiencing them, and they're not perceiving them. Or, or if they heard about it, they uh, totally write it off as something that's ridiculous as a fantasy or anything to negate it, the possibility. Hmm. Well, it's amazing to me, the amount of times I've been asked to say, explain N99 in a minute, and I can't, because it's like I say to people, like everything, go and learn yourself. Well, with me, like I'm a very, I'm a very visual person somehow, and I was never good at math. But when it comes to, uh, when it came to doing the movie, when it comes to doing music, things like that, somehow I see it as math. I see it as x equals this, and at the. Uh, when when people start talking about cryptocurrency and uh, made safe and uh, safe coin, all that type of stuff. Um, I want to be all for it, and I want to understand it, but for some reason, it's just like, it doesn't sink in with me, and I kind of have this basic idea of it, but as far as, like, the whole picture, it's just something that, um, for me, and I'm sure there's probably other people like me, but it's just kind of hard to kind of grasp the whole concept of it. But as far as N99 goes, I understand... It. I do understand uh, N99 and how that would work, you know, sort of uh, decentralized YouTube, uh, Google, etc., where uh, equality, um, you know, that sort of thing. It's not based on how many likes you have, how many hits you have, how many views you have, you know, how much you're willing to pay for advertising, you know, that sort of thing, which is what uh, YouTube is, and I, I'm i getting bombarded with YouTube ads now, I don't know if anybody else is, but it's like yeah. every other video I get is an ad, and then as I'm watching the video, I have an ad, a little banner that pops up in the bottom, I gotta exit out of that, and you know, that's, it's, yeah, we're trying to get, N99's trying to get away from all of that. 
Well, for a lot of your questions, Ryan, I mean, there will be answers next week because next week we've got um, Nick Lambert, who's the CEO of uh, Maysef, coming on. So all those sort of questions, because as, as Robert was saying, there's so many things in life that I don't know. Maybe our minds can, in time, fulfil you know that potential. But right now, our mon- our little monkey minds are struggling with what's going on because, and that's the battle we have as humanity. We have to keep hold of the you know, the, the rising wave that is the technological wave, and we've got to hold on to it because it's going to come a time not too distant in the future when machines will start breeding themselves, and we've got to be there and fighting fit as a human species, I think. Well, one of the things I, um, I tend to d- disagree with, uh, the one point I seem to disagree with people on is the this idea of sort of um, a in order of power or somebody who's actually doing something to control us I don't think that they have that set in mind I think what they have set in mind is just those sort of pseudo political webs that we've weaved and it's about feeding the whole like we had talked about on the previous episode Um, you know uh, and I'm sure Robert can agree when you come when pe- politics over here as far as like Republican Democrat uh, to me it's almost become just as much uh, as like debating football teams where you, we're not even we can't even really debate policy over here because it's just about people who will defend their Republican till the day they die and defend de- Democrat till the day they die and there's no real it, I've seen so many people try to argue with just name calling over here based on Republican Democrat and they'll say you're a liberal you just like this you just want that and it's it's not even about humanism it's not even about like actually you know trying to help people it's it's just about getting their team to win and I think a lot of people just kind of get behind that sort of mentality of the winning team, like, you know, just get, getting behind the team, fighting for something, I don't think they're really into necessarily the things that the team they're fighting for stands for, if that makes any sense. It makes sense, but uh, I should remind you that the people who control the world, they control all the parties. They finance all the parties. Oh yeah, yeah. They play them against them to get their agenda through. So uh, there's there's a level of understanding that's above Democrat, above oh, yeah. Republicans, oh, yeah. because they give money they give money to all the parties all over the world, and they they finance the mischief and uh, whatever goes on in the world, they're behind it. And when well, I yeah, say I mean, they. I well, have we know that we know that the investors, you know, they'll invest in both parties. We know that. <laughs> but it, it, it's actually it's actually much bigger than that. Uh, how can I say it without getting myself in trouble? Get yourself in trouble. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, get, get yourself in trouble. Let's do it. <laughs> Yes, the world you see, and, and as it's presented, and then there's the world, the real world of what's really going on that you don't see. Yeah. And we're because that's the convenient picture they, your, your, that is enabling you to be who you are and to think the way you think. It's it's a constant process. The, the, it, it goes on twenty. Four, seven, every iota of time there you're being bombarded with images is my pro you in understand elevating past a certain level and then at the same time your understanding is being managed so the, the technology that's available is far superior and so far ahead of what was available to the average person. 
it, once you start getting into these things, you realize it, it, it's uh, it's 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 planning and uh, control on a, a, a multi-dimensional level. It's 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 quite fascinating to to be honest. I I, I I totally agree with you, Rick, Robert. I mean, I, I think one of the things that's going on with what we're doing, and it's no mistake that we call ourselves N99. I mean, that whole tag, the 99% revolution, that was it wasn't even around five years ago. I think what's going on right now is that there's a whole technological wave that eventually I think will bring down the whole of the system because all they've had the control of so all through history, and you can go right back, right back to Mesopotamia. And they've controlled it all by stealing money from people. And every every authoritarian state, any state of any kind, whether it's democracy or anything, they get away with what they do from stealing money from us. And if we can take that power away from them, which is coming through many forms, like you're saying, through cryptocurrency, through Bitcoin, through what we're doing at MadeSafe, and it's just going to eventually, I think, connect all human beings together and... I don't know. A whole new world will, will will open up before us. Same as I said that I think the same was probably the same in the 14th century over here when the printing press came around. You know, anything that connects human beings together and makes us all realise that we're all experiencing the same people. The same people that you're talking about, Robert, are the same people that control my life and the same people that are in. They can, like you said, they control the world. This isn't just a small. Uh, you know, colloquial thing that runs one city, and I think if we can just step into the future with bravery and take hold of the, the reins of what we got, I think we can open up a new world, like you were saying, Robert. It, uh, let me say, say this uh, without getting too too far ahead of, of where the conversation is. The existence that we are in as Earth people is part of a multi-dimensional, multi-galactic uh, universe. And uh, we're, we're a part of a big, 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 big picture. And the thought that we're the only ones, I think, is quite ludicrous. There's, there are things that you can't even imagine that exist. Just on this planet, is, is, uh, there are things that we are not able to see that are right there in front of your face. And then you, you, don't, you can't even see it because you're operating on a certain level. Your conscious mind only allows you to see a certain thing. It's just like uh, the spectrum of your ability to comprehend, like visually, is limited. But there's a much wider spectrum of things going on that we just can't see because our eyes are not uh, adapted to, 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 to a view or the material plane or whatever on a multi-spectrum level. So the spirits, we're not able to see uh, the different wavelengths that uh, permeate the universe because our eyes can't, they're just not able to, uh, uh, it, it's, it's registering but we just can't see it. We're, it's it's just that we're not tuned into that bandwidth of uh, able to, uh, to to consciously see these things, and it's it's quite amazing. But we're yep. moving forward as beings, and uh, hopefully, uh, as we're progressing and transitioning to the next level, which we're in the process of doing right now, uh, more of the knowledge and wisdom will become uh, readily available to the masses of people. You know, where it will be, what I'm trying to say is where it will be commonly known. 
there, there's a lot of there's a lot of play. Yeah, uh, we we use words and don't even understand what we're saying half of the time. When they say common sense. Common House of Commons. You know, they're they're relegating your understanding to when you say common sense, you're you're, you're a commoner. You're not you're not in the uh, in the house of the lords or 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 the adepts or the people of higher knowledge. You're the British system is uh, all these words that they have. They all mean something. I, I guess living in Scotland tempts you have a understanding of uh, uh, of these words, you know, because they're they're not by accident. Words are very specific, and they they mean they have meaning for a reason. So. Uh, I just thought I'd put that out there to, to think about, you know? Well, look, it's, it's very true. I mean, George Orwell said it very well. You know, language is the, the, the thing that controls humanity the most, you know, the way that they use words, like you said, common, you know, we, these are the words that we've been, have, had, have had washed over us ever since the day we are born, and we didn't have any say over those words, you know what I mean? And, I mean, I think, like you said, the common people goes, you know, it's quite a, a very good example. I mean, I I remember I come from a very Christian background, and I, every single Jesus Christ I ever saw was white. Until, and then I remember going to Israel and thinking, wait a minute, so I've just been conditioned to think that a white man is the holy man, and it's, in actual fact, you would have probably been a black guy. But this is what I'm saying. Language has been used for thousands and thousands, thousands of years for this very reason. It's very... I think it's very dangerous because people just don't understand, like you said, they don't have the understanding all the time to st step back and think what, what's being fed to them in a very sort of subversive way. Well, oh, just a, a few years. Oh, I'm sorry. Well, just a few years, ba well, just a few years back, I had to explain to somebody that uh, it, this was. Seriously, Tim, one of the funniest things I've ever t had to tell somebody, you know, I was like, you know, Jesus, w like, if he existed, he was from, you know, Bethlehem. Do you know where Bethlehem is? And this guy was like, no. And I was like, dude, he wasn't white. Like, I, he's not that white Jesus that you see up there. Like, that's, that wasn't him. If he came from, you know, he was, he was Jewish. He was, you know, probably Middle Eastern. Sorry, like he's not looking like the lead singer from Creed. That's not happening. And this dude was just like, "No, man, like that's that's not the Jesus my grandma showed me." I'm like, <laughs> I'm like, I can't do anything for you. Like this is, this was so many centuries ago over in Africa, and like we were telling him that you know that was over in Africa, and he's like, "What do you mean it's over in Africa?" And we were like, dude, the motherland is Africa. Do you not know this? And he just completely, you know, oblivious. And like, dude, it's been proven. Like, you know, right in the middle, southern, on the coast. That's where it all started, man. The motherland. He's He had no idea. He was just thinking white Jesus, probably from, you know, Leonard Skinner's Alabama. Like, that's... Oh, it was a hard conversation, and I think I broke his heart. But, <laughs> but even in the Bible, they said his feet was the color of burnished copper. He mm -hmm. had hair of lamb's wool. What What are we talking about? I mean, you know, copper. Every any penny that I have ever seen, you know, it, it had a certain <laughs> color. You know, and uh, the the. Another interesting fact that you might find uh, that created this image is when they used the, the 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 models for the Last Supper. He used the Deborah family. I think that was the name. Or uh, anyway, it's I think it was the call the Deborah family that he used them as the models for the Last Supper. Before Previous to these drawings of uh, 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 of of Jesus appearing as 
the way we see him now in the uh, Christian church. Before that, it was it was always uh, a person of color. But how can you justify saying that people of color are inferior if you're worshiping the image of a someone in color? See, whenever whenever a nation goes into another nation or from another uh, like say the when the Europeans uh, went on this whole colonial spree all over the world the first thing they did was destroy the belief system of the people that were there and uh, and and replaced it with theirs which makes sense because if you kept your traditional belief system, uh, it would make invalid what uh, someone else is trying to tell you is the truth, you know? So it, it's these are conscious things that are, are, are being done. So it, it's fascinating. It's, it's fascinating. The, the way the world moves and the way belief systems have changed, the way uh, one belief system fights to to dominate another belief system, that that's 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 what's going on in the world now. You know, it's 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 miraculous uh, to see that to, that people don't see through this, but we're being uh, conditioned to behave a certain way and to believe a certain way, and that gets us to do certain things. So, uh, if you view the Creator as not a as I'm not talking about when you talk about Jesus, but I'm talking about that dynamic dynamic soul force that is omnipotent, omnipresent, omniscient. That is beyond color. It's beyond male or female. It's infinite. It's the creation, the creator of all things that could ever exist and ever will exist and could possibly exist. And something in human form. It's to my, that's my opinion. But uh, I kinda, when you have it, in you, or if I was you just have gonna say, image, I kind of. Well, I kind of feel you, like a, a racist some, without an uh, audience. So it, we're 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 constantly moving. Uh, our understanding is constantly developing, and uh. We'll get there eventually, but the knowledge is here. There's so many books that are out there that explains a, a lot of what I'm trying to or attempting to try to uh, uh, express to you guys. Uh, the, the, not the, the books, the internet, the knowledge that's available is just outstanding. Before, in ancient times, they used to sack libraries. Now it's all on the internet. All the information is available to you, and it's so far it's it's almost uncensored. Right now, they're they're working on that because it wasn't originally intended to a uh, uh, global thing for everybody. It was the it, the internet was developed. Uh, from uh, DARPA, which was a, a, a military uh, project of having a means to communicate amongst uh, a communication system that was uh, secure and that could uh, uh, link up, you know, globally, and it eventually morphed into what we have now. But uh, it, it's we're we're in a fascinating. Uh, time the the, the uh, technology is moving at a blinding speed. So five years from now, the the, uh, the computers that we have now and the uh, systems that's available now will almost be obsolete. They'll be like relics. I mean, they will still exist, but the the, the, the what's will come later, it will be so much more advanced than what we have now. 
And that, that, that's what gives me optimism because I think what I see around me more and more and more is that we're, we're all connecting and we're all basically, I think, in the, in the process of, of Ryan was saying, the end of his film, we're, and then we're waking up and we're in that wake up moment because, you know, that's why the, I see the, the media as a dinosaur that's just dead. You know, it's, it's had its day, you know, and, and anything they say, anything they pump out, we all know is rubbish because we're seeing through it. And they can't sell us the wars anymore. They can't just march into Iraq anymore. They can't, they have to do a lot of bullshit to get to where they want to do. Whereas 10 years ago, they could just snap their fingers and we all march behind them. And I think that's why I'm very optimistic because. I, well, what you were just saying then, Robert, you know, we are evolving into something that I think is going to be a better, a better universe and a better everything because it's going to become, we're going to strip away all the, as you were saying, all the beliefs that have just been built up around us. That basically, as you know, you didn't write any of them, I didn't write any of them, and Ryan didn't write any of them. They were just there when we were born. And it's our prerogative as human beings in the age we live in to push these away and say, this is just, it's, they're just beliefs. Like you're saying, Robert, they're just beliefs. Well, I would like to believe that that's what's going to happen. But the people who are in control, they're very... They have uh, access to things that you wouldn't dream about that can actually predict timelines. They can, they're constantly, anytime they introduce something to the uh, society, into, uh, into the world consciousness, they, they monitor what the cause and effect are of this introduction of this idea or this process and, and it's if you realize what the amount of effort that goes into keeping what we have uh, going and evolving it's 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 quite amazing it's quite amazing we're, we're Individual and individuals that are constantly working at uh, advancing their goals and agenda for the planet and for uh, and for the uh, the universe, the galaxy. Because while we're speaking, we have to realize that we're in space now. They have a. a a huge space station that's orbiting the Earth, where they're doing all sorts of fascinating things, and uh, we're moving towards the other planets. We're sending out probes. We're uh, developing new forms of propulsion. The propulsion that we have in the rocket systems now is basically uh, is basically ancient. Because the fuel that we're using, it, it, it will never enable deep space travel. That it's just impossible. So the stuff that you see on Star Trek and all these sci-fi movies, they're predicting or actually giving you a clue about what's to come. You know, the different type of drive systems that are going to be used on uh, rocket systems. You know, the the antimatter drive, the uh, the gravitational field drive, the uh, all, all, all sorts of things that we we the think are capacitor. will happen. Well, yeah, I think it was Alan Moore uh, who said, uh, you know, every time they build a new piece of technology, they're using the latest technology to build it. So they're doubling technology every single time they're building something new and uh, I think uh, Kurzweil said you know by uh, I forget what year he said probably 2042 or 2022 something like that he said you know man will was it 2049 yeah yeah man will man will merge with 
uh, machine and there will be the singularity and uh, I don't know I have this I have a very jaded opinion on all these things because I just kind of think of why you know why why would man want to merge with machine like oh well he'll be able to you know well, they say he'll be able to do all this technology. He'll be able to learn all this information. Then it's like, okay, well, why? Well, he'll be able to predict the future. Like, well, why? Why would you want to be able to predict the future? Like, you want to make more money? Is that? I mean, is it all just going to go back to money? Is it all going to go back to technology? Is, uh, you know, going it, like you brought up the other planets? Like going to another planet? Like, is like why? Why would we want to go to another planet? What is wrong with? Uh, you know, I feel like if they have the technology to go to another planet, they should have the technology to fix what they have, you know, here. Unless they want to just get away from everybody and start their own world. And uh, but I don't know. It, I, for me, it gets into a lot of philosophy and a lot of uh, what ifs and whys and very weird things that we could probably bad ideas that we could go into. <laughs> <laughs> but I love I love everything you've been saying, Robert. I love all the you know all the uh, you know just people thinking about it is great, and hearing what they have to hear say about it is uh, awesome because I know that the, a lot of uh, time and effort has to go into thinking about that these type of things because it's not just something you can uh, scratch the surface. You know, uh, we obviously got very deep very quickly. That's you kind of have to. We have to be on that same level of you know. We've all dug our hole, but you know how deep is our hole? We have to kind of balance each other out as far as how deep we are into our hole of, uh, you know, our research and how far we've gone into the inner world and thinking about uh, these sort of things that surpass the physical reality that we see. And yeah, love hearing what you have to say about it. But Ryan, I would, I would say to you that I, I mean I would. I think that one of the things that where well, I would agree with Robert that we will the reason we are going to Mars and you said why, why, why? It's the same reasons why people left one part of the earth and left to go to America or they left to go to Africa. It's it's part of the human you know, one of the things we've seen through the human history is that we've always wanted to push. And part of that push will be to leave this planet because we know eventually that the sun is going to burn dry or that we could be hit by a massive asteroid or that big volcano in Yellowstone Park go off. But at some point we're going to have to leave this planet. That's inevitable. That's why I would say I would very much agree with what Robert was saying that it's going to happen. And it, the reason it's happening is because that's part of the human nature. And uh, I can explain why it's it's being done because it's there yeah. and we're 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 uh, we are so fascinated and we want to know so much that we don't limit ourselves to to being happy with uh, one set of circumstances we want to keep pushing the boundaries of of what we can and cannot do we actually don't believe we, there's something we cannot do. We we just want to keep moving forward. We're not going to stop where, where uh, how can I say? It? We're relentless in our pursuit to uh to to move forward as a species. And uh, I would have to agree with uh, uh Tim's. They weren't they weren't happy with Europe. They, they didn't have the spices that they liked that made their food taste better. They realized if they wanted to get more gold and silver, they had to uh, pursue it other places. And they got fantastically rich off of doing that. I, I was watching something the other night. Just the Spanish alone, they moved. 16 to 17 trillion dollars worth of gold from the new what we would call the new world to Spain. They got fantastically, obscenely rich from uh, their activities and enterprises throughout the world. So, if you go to Europe and look at these fantastic palaces and they have gilded gold. They have 
fantastic jewel crowns and I mean just riches beyond comprehension that came from uh, moving out and taking control of other areas and be able to uh, utilize the resources for their benefit. It w was it selfish? Yes, it was, but it, they did what they had to do. And now there's pushback because the, the people that uh, were dominated, they say, well, hey, you know, we don't like that. We want to do our thing. We don't want to be controlled by uh, uh, England or France or whatever. You know, it's 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 a constant. It's a constant. The, the societies move, and one person gets to be number one. One group gets to be number one and ascend to the top of the uh, pile. And then the people who are at the bottom, they work their way up, and then they become number one. It's it's a fascinating uh, process that we go through on this planet. But eventually, what it's all leading to is one world where the nation state will be obsolete. Yeah. Will be a planetary system. Yeah. And we'll be able to. Uh, To, uh, to deal with other planetary systems openly. Now that's a that's a that's that's a mouthful right there. Because what I'm saying is, when you say that, you're admitting to uh, other sentient beings is outside of what we know. But if you look how vast looking outside in the night and how vast the universe is of what we can actually see. To, to, to say we're the only ones, I, I, I just don't see how anyone can come to that conclusion. It's, 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 like, Car it's, like, it's like Carl Sagan said, and, uh, billions and billions and billions and billions. That's how many, the possibility is it's there. I mean, it's it should be fairly obvious. It's endless. And uh, I'll leave this thought with you uh, while we are uh, digressing with the uh, others. Uh, Michio Kaku, he's a physicist that's known over here. He has quite a few uh, uh, YouTube videos. So one video that I happened to uh, watch was very interesting. And he was talking about the levels of sentient beings of, that are in existence. And at each level, he had a one to five uh, level. And the abilities that they have at a one or a two or a three or a four or a five level sentient being. And then he asked the question of the audience, what level do you think humanity is on Earth? according to this system. And and people were thinking about it. He says, well, I'm going to tell you, we're not even a level one. <laughs> Zero. <laughs> we're not even a level one. We're, 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 we're scratching the surface of where we could go and where we and are uh, and what we have to attain as a species. So uh, we're going to see some fascinating things exist. And if you go on, uh, what's fascinating about the Internet is all this information is right there. Yeah. What the, the algorithms of YouTube and uh, if you do searches, if they see that you're interested in a certain subject, they'll provide you with that information. So, like, when you do a search, it's really tailored to your interests. Uh, a lot of people don't realize that. So, if you expand your uh, your searches and what you view on the internet, more will become available to you. So, uh, the the possibilities of uh, of what we can 
actually uh, access in terms of wisdom and knowledge on the internet is 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 infinite. Oh, it's, it's it's immense to think. I mean, that's one of the sort of what well-known phrases or fact, you know, sort of facts about the that the the average kid walking around I don't know Malaysia has got more power in his hand of the mobile phone than they had. To, all that knowledge is in that one mobile phone is more than the knowledge they had to, that Clinton had in his his, his hands in nineteen eight in the eighties. We're moving at such an accelerated rate. Well, anybody has, uh, not just the kid in Malaysia, but anybody anywhere has that. Uh, obviously that? not me, because I have my flip phone. My, but even my that flip phone, Ryan, will have more technology than it doesn't, Well, it doesn't have any, uh, well, I can text and whatever. It doesn't have the internet, though. But, um, you know, most phones have the internet, so they, you know, the power they have at their hands. But then... You know, look at the viral stuff. Look at mainstream America and what's extremely popular popular over here. And it's you know, uh, as far as being a female artist, look at the most popular female artist that we have in America. And you know, try and tell me that you know, image is not everything and that sex doesn't sell. And I'll call you, a, you know, I'll say you're a fucking liar because, you know, it is. Se what is it? Jennifer Lopez and Iggy Azalea had a song called "Booty," I think, and it was, <laughs> the video was just butt. Like that's. You know, it's the same as Sir Mix-a-Lot back in the 90s, but, you know, Sir Mix-a-Lot had a little bit of style and grace, but they, it's just flat out, you know, bathing suits, booty, visual, whatever, you know, it's, uh, it's a very attention-grabbing thing. We have all that technology, and a lot of what's being utilized is sort of uh, TNA, dick and fart jokes, uh, you know, a lot of the mainstream, especially, you know, I, I love movies, but a lot of the mainstream comedy movies I see are geared towards that sort of... Uh, I don't even want to say Animal House humor, but just sort of frat boy humor, which is just sort of immature, juvenile. I'm not saying it's not funny. I'm not saying I can't go watch Hangover, which I haven't seen, but I'm sure I'd laugh if I saw The Hangover. I'm not denying the fact that it's funny, but it, at the end of the day, it's a dick and fart joke. Uh, you know, at the end of the day, uh, something like the song Booty is just a song about butts and just a beat, and anybody can make a beat. I mean... There's beat makers galore. They follow me every day on Twitter. I see tons of beat makers, and they all just kind of sound the same. It gets redundant. It's just ashes shaking, and you know that's uh, the, once again you have the power of all that knowledge, all, everything. Like Bill Hicks said, like you know you have all that information, all that knowledge at the base of your hands. But hey, what's that 13-year-old white girl saying? Let's put. Well. Those, Her things thoughts. That, those things that we're describing are conscious efforts uh, by the people in control mm -hmm. to distract you from information. So if you're spending all your time on uh, trivial and uh, things where you're not going to elevate your, your mindset and your consciousness or your understanding, well, you're 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 being programmed. You're you're not accepting the information that's available to you. You're limiting. You're putting yourself in a box. And 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 actually wasting time. Exactly. Because if you spend all your time doing uh, trivial things and uh and filling your mind with tr with trivial information, you're not going to compete. Because the people who do, how can I say, big things, the people who run these huge corporations or the people who work in these uh, think tanks, uh, I'm, I don't want to start naming names uh, of, of what I'm talking about, but I'm talking about the people who actually do things, who run, who run the show. These are very, very, very smart well-read people and, and they had you you wouldn't you couldn't imagine they know more about you and your history than you know about yourself because it's their business to know and uh, as you elevate or raise in stature or how can I say 
as you raise in the levels, the strata of people who do things, who people who actually are the at the managerial and control level, your 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 access to knowledge becomes even more intensified. And but then again, uh, you can't talk about that to anybody. The, that the, the, that knowledge is becomes restricted. So when they talk about security clearances, there's a reason for that. Because the average person is not able to uh, manage that information or understand it in a proper in its proper context. The, 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 the picture is so much bigger than what is being presented. So it's 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 hard to explain uh, what I'm trying to express because we feel that we should all be free and everybody there should be total transparency. But there are some people who don't want to know. It's it's too threatening. They don't want to know that. It's it's too much. It's just too mind-boggling. It's they're just not conditioned to accept it. But the people that do want to know, you should uh, search and be relentless in your search. Yes. And uh, it, it, it will enable you to see things that you never thought were possible. Not that it's going to be easy. So it's just going to have to you. It's not that it doesn't look no. that way. Oh, the, the the truth is never easy. My, you know, my experience was blown when I was probably like 15, and after that, it was just open-minded reading, researching, trying to figure out why, trying to figure out, you know, what. Like I said before, kind of, uh, and this kind of, uh, I hate to kind of, I think we're getting in towards the end, but I hate to end on this note, but sort of when I was looking into religion and things like that, when I was like 15, really studying into them, it it just felt like football teams or sports teams like you know which one do I pick which one do I root for um, and really it kind of felt like that to where even if you point out a flaw in something like that somebody just automatically comes back and they have an answer to defend their um, defend their whatever whether it's their belief or just the actual broad uh, terminology in general that they want to defend and it just kind of seemed like this whole um, I guess like faceless ideology that they're just like they're so stuck on it that they they'll fight for it no matter what and they won't even hear when you try to bring up points about it or talk in some sort of sense that might question it it's just no root 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 team 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 and uh, it gets very lopsided, it gets very one-sided, and it's hard to be open-minded and actually be accepting of everyone if you're going to sit there and just keep rooting team, team, team. And uh, so much gets lost when, you know, sides get picked and lines get drawn, and it, that to me is just one of the terrible things about, you know, where we are now at 2014, and we're still drawing lines, we're still separating people from people, we're still building on stereotypes, we're still, you know... Oh, this is a lost doing one. well. Yeah, it's just... I don't know. It's like one step forward, one step backward. What we're doing, I feel, is like two steps forward, three steps forward, Network 99 steps forward. Uh, but uh, a lot of things outside of this, you know, you see news, you see shootings, you see wars, you see candidates and uh, debates and just two-party systems and people being... Uh, told whatever and propaganda and et cetera, et cetera, and it feels like one step backward, and it's an up, it feels like we're fighting an uphill battle, but we're still fighting. And it's, I'm glad we had Robert on this week. I'm glad we were able, to, you know, finally connect. Uh, loved hearing everything you had to say, Robert. It's been great, great talking with you. 
Yeah, well, they, they, they don't call it mass communication for, for nothing. And then when you say religion, you know what? Religion, if you look up religion in the dictionary, you know what it means? To bind up. So think about that for a minute. If religion means to bind up, you're binding up a people to a certain belief system. So once you have them in that bound category that you've created, now you 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 con you you control their mindset and and the way they think and the way they believe and you also control their concept of what the truth is. So if you can do that, you can do anything with these people now that you have bound up to believe a certain thing. If you tell them the guy on the other side of the mountain. The people on the other side of the mountain, they're the worst people in the world. Go over there and destroy them for the greater good of whatever. They will do it willingly, with glee, and, 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 and serving the purpose. And they will feel so gratified with doing it because this is what they've been told. This is, this is uh, the mindset that's been... Uh, constantly pounded into them from uh, from the time they were born. This is what they've heard. This is what's been preached to them. This is what they talk about. This is, it's, it's, it's control. It's all about control. Well, it, yeah, I mean, it, it, you look at it right, and I'm, it's sort of like, I would, I would, I would want to sort of put my like, final say, and now I'm going to ask Robert to sort of have his final say, and uh, Ryan's have his final say, but my, I would, I'll kind of wrap this up this discussion up, and I think my my little sort of two pennies worth at the end would be it's all about choices, you know, whether, whether it's been we talk about music, creativity, the future of the world, the planet, everything's about choices, and it's we live in a time now where I truly believe that people have got more choices at their fingertips than we we've just been discussing than they ever had before. And it's up to people. They can have, they have the choice to listen to this discussion. And man, what we, we've discussed a lot in this discussion, and we've been we've tapped some deep issues. Or they can go away and have a and say, and they can watch you know Jennifer Lopez. It's all about choices. And I think we live in, in an age where that all through history, human history we've all had choices. It's what we do with it. And I'm really excited about what I see is coming very quickly around the corner. I mean, next week's podcast will, will be a very good addition of, to, you know, when we talk about that more, you know, when we talk about, you know, what we're trying to build and stuff. And I just think it's all about choices. And always remember, people, that, you know, not only life is people, but life is choices. And whatever situation you're in, whatever hole you feel you're in at the moment, you know, whether it's like what we talked about last week, whether you're feeling in a hole of depression or whatever it may be, it's always about choices. And that's how I think. But, you know, it's my last sort of like parting shot. Let's remember that life is choices. Ryan? It looks like we lost Robert. <laughs> he's, been, he's been kidnapped by the other dimensions. Uh, yeah, I was going to say the same thing. Um... Yeah, I was gonna give Robert. I was gonna uh, ask Robert, like you know, where people can find. He's back now. Uh, where can you can find now. his stuff. Yeah. <laughs> Ceiling Demons music video coming soon. Um, the if you go to the Twitter page, the, the the site that Robert was mentioned earlier was called Loud of the War. If you just put on in your Google search engine out of the wall or go to the ceiling demons on social media, Facebook, etc., and find the link. And there you will find the first the first edition. Well not the first edition because we played it live on this podcast. But it's you can hear it now and download it for yourself. And soon the video is coming because we, as we was mentioned earlier on, there's a lot of work going on with that. And I'm hoping Robert comes back in because I'll everyone to know Robert tell everyone where he can get hold of his music. <laughs> I don't know if I'd say a lot of work's going in the video, but a lot of fun's going into it. So. <laughs> you back, Robert?
Can you hear us, Robert? Tim Skew, you just said the magic word before I uh, had to uh, rejoin the, uh, the hangout. I got booted off. But choice, that is the magic word. It's all about choices. We're always making choices. And uh, most of the time, if you're not at a certain conscious level, you don't even realize you're making a choice. But every iota moment of your being is about a choice. And the more you recognize that you're making choices, the more you can make, the, the, the better your chances are of making a better choice. So you, do you hit the nail on the head, uh, Mr. Coomber? <laughs> So Robert, final word. Um, where can if people want to get some of your music, want to listen to you, want to hear about it, where where would they go? Well, I'm on several sites. I have my own personal website, robleyamusic.com. Uh, I'm on SoundCloud, Reverb Nation. I'm on almost all the major streaming sites. Uh, from Spotify, uh, Radio, uh, Beats Music, uh, E Music. I mean, it's it's just a whole list. I I would be here for for a while of trying to explain. Uh, of course, I'm being distributed worldwide. I'm being accessed by all these different people that create a revenue stream. So the more people go to these sites. And uh, uh, click on uh, you know Rob Lee and music Robert Leach, and listen to my music. It's making me more viable in terms of uh, as a, a, a business entity or a commodity in the music business. Uh, I think I had uh, I had said something similar to that in my email to you, uh, Tim, uh, that this is a business and uh, people are looking at numbers, who you influence, who knows who's your, uh, your reach. These are all analytical site uh, uh, or if you have like John Facebook or or Google Plus, uh, these analytics are available to you, so you can recognize uh, where your uh, your uh, your message is 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 reaching. The, the what your content, where it goes, and who's viewing it or utilizing it, I should say. So it, it's fascinating, and when I look at uh, just where I am right now, where my music is going, it's global. It's, it's going all over the world on every continent. So, you know, the, the possibilities are, are, are basically infinite, you know, of what I can do with it if I, uh, you know, make the proper choices. There would be that magic word again and uh, have a strategic vision of where I want to go and how I want to get there. I mean, you're going to have to tweak it and constantly uh, adapt you know, to changing circumstances, but at least you have to know where you want to go. So I, I hope that answered your question. It's, there's not too many sites that I'm not on in terms of uh, streaming services. And uh, downloads, there's, you know, the, the standard Amazon, iTunes, uh, uh, they have uh, MediaNet that's popular for uh, people in the English-speaking world, Canada, UK, and uh, America. There, there's so many different places 
where the music is available. I mean, and also in other markets too. I, I, I'm not mentioning like they have uh, sites like Angami, uh, Claro Music in uh, Latin America and South America. Angami, I think, is for North Africa and the Middle East. There are quite a few other uh, sites or uh, services that I'm available on. So no matter where you are on this planet, if you have uh, internet, uh, you you can access the music that's available, and also uh, you can also purchase the first uh, album is available <laughs> as a CD, and you can get that through Amazon, Paul Records, and other uh, sites that affiliate with those uh, uh, companies that I mentioned. So. Uh, it's 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 quite a uh, smorgasbord of, of of companies that where my uh, music is available, and it, it totally fascinates me the way this whole thing is growing. Well, Robert, I'm gonna I'm gonna finish on the song um, "Enjoy It" three six five eight. Do you do you want to sort of like give us a bit of a kind of a lead in, tell us what the song's about or anything about it and then we'll play out on that and if you want to stay online I'll play the whole song and then we can chat afterwards but just tell us a bit about Enjoy It and I'll finish on that. Well Enjoy It if I remember correctly uh, the way I create music is I get a concept in mind that's usually a title and usually if you have a title you can create the atmosphere because your mind has something to focus on and you're actually imagining an emotion. So I guess enjoy it when I conceived it or uh, created it was about enjoying it. You know, just basically enjoying it. You know, whether it's uh, intimacy or whatever gives you pleasure. You know, great food. I mean, I'm a big food fan. I love the food shows. Or, or just knowledge, you know, and understanding, you know, when you absorb something that just elevates your whole mindset and you just get a thrill from it, and, and it's like if I'm into books, so if I'm reading something that's totally fascinating, I'm really enjoying it. If you eat a great dish of, of, of food or cuisine, you know, we're exposed to so much on this planet. Uh, like New York is like fascinating. They ha any type of uh, national dish is available in some restaurant, some place in New York. I imagine it's the same way in London or any big city. And uh, New York is is really a, a really fascinating place. Well, that's a perfect. Perfect uh, explanation of that song and history behind it. So we're finished on uh, Enjoy It. Um, Robert, uh, we'll have to get definitely back on the podcast because I feel there's so much more we can talk about. And I really look forward to having another session with you because, I've, like I said, we've hardly scratched on the surface of things, I think. Um, so I'll just like to say goodbye. I'll make, I'll make an espresso for the after... Uh yeah, the post talk. <laughs> okay, cool. Well, um, from all the way oh, here. I'm a, I'm a big coffee. Fan. I love coffee. <laughs> oh my goodness. Oh man, me and me and, me and Robert so get along great. I mean. <laughs> well, from here in Scotland, I consume so much coffee on a daily basis. Is 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 crazy. <laughs> Well, from here in Scotland, I want to say good night and um, life is people, people. And this is Enjoy It by Robert Leach. Enjoy it, Thank people. Thank you on, on your podcast. No, no problem.